Um, my name is Kate Lemon. I work for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. I'm currently the regional manager for the Trenton Arrowash, which is the lower, lower third, I suppose, of the county. Um, and I've had 20 years now, so I've had uh, various roles there, um, all to do with land management, habitat management, um, looking after nature reserves, but also working in the wider living landscape as well. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about our beaver reintroduction project, um, which is particularly exciting because um, we're virtually there. The beavers are coming, which I have to admit at moments we probably didn't think we would ever actually say. Um, a little bit about the wildlife trusts. I will just assume that perhaps not everybody knows who the wildlife trusts are. I'm sure you do. Um, but we are um, the leading partnership, the leading conservation um, groups partnership it, with, across the UK. And unlike a lot of the other organisations that are national level and filter down, the wildlife trusts are generally at county level and work up to a smaller UK office. So that means that we're all autonomous in our own rights within our own counties, uh, but we do work closely with each other, with lots of other NGOs and then obviously the UK office does lots of the sort of national campaigning things um, and we pretty much uh, our remit is to look after all of the wildlife and all natural spaces um, within the areas that that we're based. So Derbyshire Wildlife Trust formed in 1962 Derbyshire Naturalist Society that's very common for pretty much all of the wildlife trusts that was their roots that's their heritage um, and we look after um, land and work looking after wildlife within the county. Um, but we are also involved in uh, wider partnerships. So for example, we work with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust on a joint project. We work closely with Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. And in fact, in the Dark Peak area, we're just setting up a partnership, which is six wildlife trusts all coming together within that region, North Derbyshire, Yorkshire, um, and, and that area there. So we've currently got 18,000 members it's growing all the time. Um, we've got um, a lot more staff than when I first started ago and um, you name it, we do it. So we've got staff sort of really working on all different areas as well. Okay, I'm just going to try and just, sorry, I need to move my little window so I can actually see what's on my slides. So here's a map of the county. Um, and I think you can see from this, we've got each of these numbers is a nature reserve and 48 at the moment. Um, it is growing all the time. We're ambitious. We have expanded the number of nature reserves considerably over the years. We've got some historical sites that the Trust has owned for the last 50, 60 years. I think it's fair to say that our acquisition policy is very different these days. And we are looking um, really along the Lawton principles of bigger, better and more joined up. So we're always um, on the eye out to expand our current nature reserves. Um, I can't tell you which site, but yesterday at auction, we were able to purchase an additional 15 acres of land adjacent to um, a current nature reserve. So that's taken that site up by another um, nearly 50% third in size, which is fantastic news. Um, Another site that I look after, again, I'm not able to say at the minute because it's going through the solicitors, but we are purchasing land on the edge of that, making it bigger. Um, we're always looking for that, that connectivity and seeing our nature reserves as the sort of bastions of, of, for wildlife there. Um, because we've got such a good spread across the county, it means that we've got every semi-natural habitat type um, in the county represented. So from the upland moorland of the Dark Peak, limestone grassland of the White Peak, coal fields in the east, we've got Peak Fringe and Derwent Valley, right through to the lowland grassland and the wetlands in the Trent Valley. Perhaps the only area of the county that we don't have a significant land holding or influence in at the moment, um, and you can see that on the map, is really below Ashbourne and between Ashbourne and Derby in that, that southwest corner. So we are going to talk about Willington Wetlands Nature Reserve. Um, now those, those 
of you that know the county and perhaps know the area will recognise the cooling towers in the top right hand corner of that photograph, which are, um, it was Willington Power Station, the old power station there in the cooling towers. Power station's now gone, the site will almost certainly be developed probably for housing, the cooling towers are still there and a fairly iconic feature. So um, it's 47 hectares of ex gravel pits adjacent to the River Trent on the edge of Willington Village. Um, we purchased the land in December 2005 and it was already a very popular bird watching spot and known as one of the top sites in, in England um, for bird watching and for wetland birds. Um, even when they were still really finishing off working it as a gravel pit, so there were people still um, accessing the site and being aware there was a lot of interesting wildlife there. You can see from the map on the left that the main block of land is the land that we purchased in 2005. The smaller block up to the sort of top right, that was some land that we purchased. Um, oh, gosh. It disappear in our lives doesn't it um, that would have been two years ago we purchased that land um, but we are always looking for more we, we would like to buy the land between those two bits we're looking to go to the south um, we have Senex Willington quarry um, down to the bottom sort of the bottom left corner, the, the southwest corner, um, which they are currently working, but they are working their way through that reserve, that, that land, sorry, and that will come under our management in time as well. Um, so, you know, we're ambitious, we would like more. So a quick whistle stop tour around the wildlife that we find at Willington. As I mentioned, it was already a very popular bird watching spot. It's a fantastic spot for a huge array of wildlife. Um, you can really see from the previous picture, if I flip back to that, you don't need a key to see that these are different habitat types on the reserve. There's a lot of different habitats there. Large expanses of open water, which is the darker blue with the E. The orange is grassland. We've got deciduous woodland and wet willow car woodland, which is the green. Reed beds, islands, you name it, we've, we've got it there. Um, so a wide array of wildlife, including some of our protected species. Um, spined loach in the top right hand corner has recently been discovered there, uh, which made one of my, uh, my colleagues very excited. Apparently it's a very uh, rare species. A quick whistle stop tour around the uh, reserve uh, reed bed. Uh, this is one of the sing largest single blocks of reed bed in Derbyshire, lowland bat habitat, um, and we have bittern coming in on a regular basis over winter. Not yet large enough to attract bittern to stay and breed, that's certainly our ambition, and as we move into the um, old Senex quarry next door, there's certainly um, scope to have more reed beds, and probably more reed beds that aren't um, as, as well visited perhaps, so some quieter areas for them as well. Uh, reed warbler, sedge warbler, reed bunting, uh, white as well. Ooh, here we go. So wet grassland, lots of wet grassland, um, managed by some of my four-legged colleagues here. Uh, Low-level grazing with native breed species. Uh, these are actually the wrong cows that we have on site now. We now have a grazier who puts longhorn cattle on site. We have our own highland cattle that we use on a number of reserves, but we're very fortunate that we've got um, somebody nearby who has a very quality herd of um, longhorn cattle that we use as, as conservation lawn mowers there. Here we go. So a colleague put this together. So little pictures fly in. Snipe, heron, curlew, again, all present on site in great numbers um, all year round. We're under high level stewardship on this site for um, one of the higher paid categories, which is the breeding uh, waders option, not just the overwintering, but actually for breeding as well. Lots of open water there. As I said, it's a huge site. We've we're able to we're able to do quite a lot of work when we first got the site. So it, I think it's fair to say that 
quarries and sites like this are being restored these days um, the awareness now of putting them back into a good state for wildlife is much higher than it was perhaps 20 or 30 years ago so we bought a reserve that was a bit bath shaped in places where we had very steep sided banks very deep water and not a lot around the edge we've done a lot of work to grade in the edges so the reed bed can get established and get thicker um, and we've had machines in and we've put islands in we've taken out causeways to create completely water surrounded islands so species such as oyster catcher are able to breed there in safety um, and otter on the nature reserve now we knew we had otter because we we're regularly finding sprains and signs of them we put out some trail cameras and um, our jaws dropped when we watched it and actually saw we had two otters scampering around uh, which was uh, absolutely fantastic Largest bodies of open water really in the Trent Valley at the moment in very close proximity to the River Trent. So that makes it incredibly attractive to waterfowl and for species that are using the river to navigate across the UK. So for example, osprey as well. We have got an osprey pole up on the site. Um, they have been seen. They haven't really come and stayed for any significant period of time yet. Um, smaller ponds and ditches, some of which are wet all year round, some dry out in the summer. Um, and the variety in this open water habitat benefits such a, a wide range of wildlife obviously as well um, GCN on the site fantastic um, range of odonata um, here we go lapwing breeding on site as well um, water rail uh, great white and little egrets and uh, we've even had cattle egret on the site as well okay Ooh, sorry more more species whizzing in so um, why beavers well, we have this fantastic nature reserve that is merrily trying to do its own thing, such as it wants to do. We have a significant problem with willow. We've spent a considerable amount of time and effort over the years trying to maintain that balance, that mosaic of habitats, and try and keep succession in check. It's something that conservationists have done. I think it's fair to say, particularly having worked for the same organisation for 20 years, um, you take your eye off the ball it's back with a vengeance and it doesn't it's not working we're not able to control the water level significantly on this reserve so we're not able to flood out the roots um we've all used lots of glyphosate over the years as a policy now within certainly within derbyshire wildlife trusts and across the wider wildlife trusts it is now the last tool in the box that we want to reach for we're trying to find every other way we can manage species without having to reach for um, you know, chemicals that we know now are very harmful. Um, and staff and volunteers have done a lot of work clearing it. And you can see in this picture here, this is all willow that's come back. It, we're effectively coppicing it. Um, it's, so beavers are a natural approach. They are love eating willow. They're going to come and control the willow for us. And they can control it far quicker than we can. And they can keep on top of it as well. Um, we've been mimicking the, the natural browsing of these large roaming herbivores. Well, that's what the beavers are. Um, we need to remove the willow to try and prevent our reed bed from drying out. Um, and we don't want to just end up with nothing but a big willow car woodland but we do want to have that variety of species. We do want to have that dynamic going on there as well. So you saw the cattle, we currently graze the cattle uh, at very low densities on the two large areas of wet meadow that we've got, um, but they don't enter the reed bed and control the scrub in there. Um, they, we have sheep on site, we have um, Hebridean and Soe sheep, again, absolutely love willow but they won't go and get their feet wet and in fact if they do it's usually fairly disastrous because they get wet and they sink we did have conic did a brilliant job going into the reed bed stimulating the reed bed growth chewing that off um, eating the willow unfortunately they were so successful that the amount of grassland on the site led to them getting laminitis which uh, is a effectively type 2 diabetes in horses um, and we had to take them off site so we have tried all sorts of different methods and now we've got to the point where we thought let's try beavers so beavers are known as a keystone species. The definition of that is an animal that has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its abundance. 
So a couple of beavers are going to have a really big impact. Um, commonly referred to as ecosystem engineers or ecosystem architect, architects because they will change the environment that they are in to suit their needs. They will not adapt to an environment, the environment has to adapt to them. But in doing so, they create these very complex wetland habitats for many other species as well. Um, and with the constant threat of climate change, um, and you know lots of other different methods first of all they are a very low carbon emitting solution non-polluting solution um, but they're also going to help and reduce and mitigate the effects of environmental disasters and climate change on our natural environment as well so beavers are special they're vegetarians who are non-selective they'll eat all sorts of different things um, they will eat the bark the twigs the leaves they'll eat every part of it they'll also use that material to um, break it into smaller pieces to build dams and lodges the dams are frequently built on rivers and streams so moving water bodies because what they're trying to do is create a deep body of water on one side particularly to enable them to enter um, their lodge or their their little house entrance um, and that is going to deter predators and keep them safe. Um, the dams then act as this invaluable tool for filtering as well as creating pools in what could be otherwise fast forces that often as we know have limited habitats. So when a beaver creates a dam it's flooding the area behind it and that creates that diverse mosaic of wetland. So it's slowing the motion of water and it's preventing sediments from flowing downstream so start to act as silt traps. But again a lot cheaper, a lot more effectively than humans have ever found a way to consistently trap silt um, and prevent that deposition further downstream or in the water bodies, the rivers that we then know are causing um, flooding in towns and houses. Um, the vegetation that builds up behind the dams also becomes very dynamic. Um, succession is taking its place. We now know that trees, for example, sequester the most carbon in the first 75 years of their life. So these new and young and forming habitats are really very deep carbon sinks and can lock up a lot of it. Um, dams can also decrease the impact by reducing the water flow. So rather than having these highs and lows of water flow down again, so sort of imagine a canalized or fast flowing river or stream, just starts to take, take the extremes off and say up to 60% of these extremes um, can be reduced, which is quite a considerable percentage really. And that, that's statistically been proven in science. That's not me just making up or picking figures up off, uh, off the internet. Um, but this same mechanism is also a solution for drought periods when water in pools are being held, but can equally be utilized by humans as well. So this, both of these are useful to help level out, say that extremes of floods and droughts. So native trees such as willow and alder have evolved alongside beavers for millions of years, and they are very um, munching tolerant, if that's even a, a phrase, um, they're, they're quite happily will regrow, as we know, with willow, you cut it, it grows back, alder will coppice, it will come back. Um, it will grow from the felled stems or cuttings again and it will know you know that can actually be a real problem with willow because you cut it what do you do with the cuttings for years burning it has been the solution because you don't want to leave it on the wetlands it'll either get washed off and go and block up other water courses or be a problem um, or it'll just regrow you'll just end up with a, a new clump of willow growing again um, but the way that beavers are actually managing vegetation is in a much more natural uh, age and location structure than humans ever can. Um, you know, we, we think we're being um, random. We generally aren't because we just can't help ourselves, but we're neat and tidy and do a nice, neat area. It might be an area that we can reach or we can access some, somewhere might be too deep water or too difficult to get at. But beavers don't have that problem. They're not going to sink into the silt like we do. They're not going to struggle in deep water like we do. So they can get to areas that we can't do and they can create a much more diverse, again, um, age structure, but also say that geographical 
physical or a locate as well. Um, the deadwood that is created, again, is far more diverse than if we are making our own deadwood piles. Um, it tends to be more secure, so it tends to be less likely to be a nice, neat habitat stack that we've made, that then the first flood that comes along picks it up, washes it away, dumps it somewhere else, gives the EA a huge headache, makes you unpopular with your neighbours. Um, the woody debris that they leave behind, and you can see in the bottom picture of how diverse the, the range of material is, that, that beaver is merrily making into a dam. Um, over 2,000 species of invertebrates are estimated to be supported by these. And of course, they're the building blocks of all our food chains. They're the food sources for the freshwater animals. Um, they provide shelter for, for fish um, and for young fry to hide from predators and perches for birds to rest on. So beavers are native to the Northern Hemisphere and were once widely spread across Europe. Um, um, but um, the last sighting in the UK was the 16th century, uh, and they were hunted for everything, um, fur, scent sacks, meat, you name it. Um, this is a very obviously old picture. I assume these strange sacks that appear to be coming out of the middle beaver's mouth are the castoreum sacks that were something that was very much um, coveted or beavers were being hunted specifically for. Um, and, and the quote is um, relatively hilarious knowing what we know now, but this was the attitude that, you know, beaver ate fish, so they were competing against humans for fish, and when they ran out of fish, they just pop out and eat a few lambs as well. So, you know, nothing good about beavers. And then they returned to the water from whence they came. Um, couldn't be further from the truth, but that's what people thought. <laughs> so this map um, shows uh, beaver, archaeological beaver finds um, from in Britain since the last ice age. Now, the map itself is the, the viewed because you can see, you can probably see around the East Anglia, Lincolnshire, Fenland area, that there's a number that says 43, and then lots of other dots around it. Um, actually, these are beaver finds that we've found. So these are very much biased by. Um, development. So, for example, digging for peat in the fens has brought up a lot of evidence because we've been actively going into that deeper soils. Um, also, the uh, Somerset Levels M5 corridor, where again, there's been a lot of deep earthworks. Um, also biased by soil conditions, because we know that acid soils destroy bone more alkaline soil uh, or wetter sites can actually um, hold uh, artifacts in the ground. So it's probably a very small sh snapshot of the true distribution, but at least it shows us they were pretty much everywhere. Um, we also know that beavers were widespread across the UK by place names. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my throat. So again, this is another uh, piece of information that, that you know, reinforces the fact that beavers were all over the place. Um, this is a slide that I borrowed from Derek Gow and his talk, uh, which he very kindly shared with me. Um, and these exposures uh, were revealed in Devon following some floods when part of the riverbank collapsed. And the assumption was made that actually these look very much like there was some sort of underwater or some sort of um, burrow that potentially had underwater access. Um, unfortunately, before any more significant um, digging or archaeological investigation could be undertaken here, there was another flood event and this section of Riverbank disappeared. But it, it's all adding to that body of evidence. Beavers were very, very widespread. So why were people so keen to hunt beavers? Well, as you can see from the picture on the left, there's not a lot of use. Um, an adult beaver weighs 25 kilograms and is the size of a Labrador. So there's pretty good eating on one of those. There's also a lot of fur there to be harvested. Um, the picture on the right shows the relative amount of pelt that can be get, be, 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 sorry, be obtained from three of these different very commonly species, commonly hunted species in um, sort of medieval and, and, and later times. Um, 
there is records coming from the laws of Huildar, the King of Wales in 19, 9, 940 AD, showing that a pine marten pelt was worth 24 pence, but a beaver pelt was worth 120 pence. Now, I'm not sure about you, but trying to catch a pine marten, pretty feisty, pretty fast, or going and catching a beaver who are relatively sluggish, stick in one space, I think I know which ones I'd be out there hunting. Um, the Castoreum was a, a, a prized um, resource as well. The picture, just how much you could use bits of beaver for. So the Castoreum is this resinoid extract that results from the dried and alcohol tinctured beaver castor. So the castor sacs are these um, glands that are, live in the pelvic abdominal uh, ab, ab, pelvic abdominal space uh, next to the anal glands um, at the base of the tail. Um, now it's in the EU it's illegal to hunt beavers so most of the castoreum now comes from the US and Canada but it's still a very popular substance it's still very much uh, beavers are being deliberately hunted for it and it's still uh, very widespread. I was quite shocked actually when I investigated this and started trying to find images of things that castoreum was used in. I was thinking it was something that was a historical thing or perhaps it's a very obscure branch of medicine. No, nope. um, it's, it's cheap and cheerful. It's uh, a cheap version of the name it's used even now in perfumes um, apparently it has a sort of leathery smell or it's a, it can have a, a that musk base um, in some of the stronger perfumes um, it's used to flavor foods such as uh, say ice cream sweets um, it contains um, a high level of salicylic acid i never knew that which obviously um, is a component of aspirin so it can be used in um, pain relieving medicines as well as herbal medicines um, there's even uh, specific alcoholic drinks so biava halt is a swedish schnapps which translates to beaver shout but it's used in beer it's used in whiskey um, so I was quite shocked <laughs> just how much castoreum is still used. I just imagined it was something that was way back in the past. So to go back to why do we want beavers back? Well, we've got a problem in the UK. We've got a problem on global scale. Climate change is happening. We are seeing more and more of these types of images on the news of these has almost worn off now because we're so used to seeing it every year we see pictures like this and these aren't happening in Bangladesh or far-flung corners of the world these are happening right under our nose in a town near you in your town down the road um, we, we've got a really big problem we're building on floodplains so we've lost that area to absorb rain and to allow it to percolate slowly through the ground not least we've then got houses on floodplains um, we have a big problem with farmland and soil erosion in the UK and that silt is washing down and filling rivers so historically rivers were dredged they were cleaned out a lot of river banks you end up with that where you've got a, a curved, a higher riverbank that then curves down to the surrounding land. They've been created um, by the silt that's been excavated out of the rivers and dumped. Um, and we know that climate change is leading to these wetter winters where the ground is saturated earlier in the winter and it's like a sponge, it's full, it can't absorb any more water. Oop, here's my presenter, here we go. So beaver dams are often assumed to be huge structures that would block entire rivers and cause huge pools of water to form. Um, and, and then we're going to flood people. We're going to make flooding worse because we've got beavers. So this image from the top left is an image that I've pinched off the internet. And this is um, in Canada. Um, and this is the sort of thing, again, I kind of imagine this is what beavers will build. Well, they will if they have to. So this body of water, this river that they have dammed in Canada, it's huge. They've had to build a dam that big because that's how wide it is. Look at the bottom two pictures. These come from beaver enclosures in the UK, in England. So this is what the beavers have done. Now, these are really modest, small dams. These aren't 
even particularly impressive, perhaps a little bit underwhelming, but they are serving exactly the same purpose that the beavers need. They need that deeper water to feel safe, to dive, to be able to access their lodges. And you can see from the right hand exactly how that principle works. You can see the higher water level trapped by their dams. So they've got that area there. Um, and I say the bottom, well, both of the bottom slides, but particularly the bottom left hand picture just looks like a pile of twigs, quite honestly, but it's working. And those smaller twigs actually really effective at holding the water back, really effective at, at catching the silt as well. So how do dams affect a water course and the surrounding wetlands? Again, these are real beaver dams on the left hand side. This is really uh, probably a, a sort of wetland or stream or um, small river that we're used to seeing in the UK. Um, th I, this picture could have been taken on any one of the nature reserves I manage in the Trent Valley or the Arawash Valley. It's, it looks very, very similar. And again, possibly a little bit underwhelming, but I can see what the beavers have done here because they've built a dam backed up a body of water. And then when that started to taper out because of the gradient, they've just popped another one in. And they've just carried on doing that till they've created the habitat. They're gonna sit there and enjoy where they're living. They are active, they will change it. They will make it what they need to make it. Um, looking at the six diagrams um, on the right. Um, so A is showing that beavers will dam um, a stream during low flows to create the deeper pools. So very canalized, very straight, very fast flowing, deep cut, cut through the silt, cut through the alluvial deposits to create a, a water body that's actually quite a lot lower than the surrounding land. So even the capacity of that stream in spate being allowed to spill into that neighboring land and take some of that flow, it isn't going to happen because that water level is now so much lower than the surrounding land form. And that's again, as humans, that's what we've done by desilting rivers. We've created these higher sides. We've almost um, made, a, made a problem in the future. Um, B is showing that actually the dam has failed. There's been a blowout. They've built a dam, they've tried to make a pool, but because the trench is so narrow, because the water water comes down so the dam has failed but because it's failed it's left the material there the material's wedged in they've coppiced some of that willow so the roots are there they've felled trees that still remained attached so they've managed to make what we again have been trying to do for many years with our woody debris or our leaky barriers in in water courses so c shows that because they've done this the trench has started to become wider which automatically then starts to reduce that stream power well, the beavers then are able to build wider but more stable dams. Um, looking onto slide D, so fast streams often have high sediment loads, but when the water is slowed, the beaver ponds rapidly fill up with the sediment um, and they will temporarily abandon those. But th that's fine because what they've done is they've made themselves a pool, the silts come along, but because it's then become too silted up and that accumulated sediment is actually starting to vegetate, the beavers think, all right, well, it's not quite right. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to make what I need. And they start again. And then when you get to E, where the beaver dams have actually raise that water reconnect the stream to its former floodplain so we've lifted the water level up and we've created a floodplain where perhaps we'd lost one um, and then f shows that that vegetation and sediment now fills the ponds the stream ecosystem has really developed a high level of complexity with beaver dams live vegetation dead wood slowing the flow of water raised ground levels and you've got these multi-thread channels forming you've often got them connected to these off-channel wetlands and really the entire area is saturated um, look at the amount of water that that diagram in F can hold compared to where we are in A. So again, it's a common uh, fear that beavers are going to cause a problem, they're going to flood an area. Now, for example, if the land on the side of the stream on A had been built on and we've got houses there, well, of course, we wouldn't want to introduce beavers to that point because we will flood those houses. But if that is an area where we can restore we can restore that capacity then actually in a very small space the beavers will do that they don't need huge territories they're not going to travel for miles they're not a mobile species they're happy in one or two hectares 
So this is um, a real beaver relief in the UK. Um, I, I really, I would like to find the before picture, but this after picture is again, a very small scale release and it's annotated to show what the effect of the beavers has had. So you can see top right hand corner stream comes in not too bad it's quite wiggly it's got some meanders in it got a little bit of a um I don't know if you can see if I wiggle my mouse if you can see that my cursor uh we've got probably looks like an offline pool here the stream comes in and originally it just came through here pretty straight pretty boring can you see how we're getting banks here we've probably got quite intensive agricultural fields around it so there's probably an element of wanting to bank it up to keep the water in they don't come into the farmland too much and look at the difference that the beavers have made in just this small area so we've got meanders we've got sediment retention we've got ground level water rising uh, we've got much a greater increased diversity in the street the tree structure and composition offline pools um, seasonal areas um, quite incredible again i was quite surprised how local beavers will stay and what a huge impact they can have on a relative. Lots of beaver studies, lots of beaver studies going on. Um, our project will be uh, very closely monitored for five years. We're using a wide range of methods to identify and assess the changes that the beavers are going to build about, bring about. We've already spent the last 12, 18 months building up a large body of data and imagery um, as a baseline, as a comparison. Um, there's been studies done. Um, the amount of silt that is suspended in the water above and below a beaver site. You can see just very quickly from the results on that chart there that considerably more suspended sediment above a beaver site than there is below. You can see from the bottom two photographs, um, the before is on the right, the after is on the left. Um, what I find really interesting about this before photo, ah, no, come back is that you've almost, it almost looks like whether this area has got an underlying water table or this is historical, almost sort of paleo vegetation channels. But what really makes it, isn't, I find interesting is that this shading, the different colored shading on this before picture is almost mirrored by what has happened when the beavers have popped a dam in at about this point here. And again, this is sort of the living photographic evidence um, of the diagrams that we, the six diagrams. There's still a considerable amount of land behind this area that has not been impacted by the beavers and would still be perfectly good agricultural land. So again, I find that really interesting that in such a small area, the change is so dramatic, but it's actually still remained quite localized. So I am very excited to say that it is not going to be long until we have our beavers. They have been caught in Scotland. Um, they have had their health checks. We are just waiting for the results of their health checks. Um, we are expecting to see them very, very soon. So a brief beaver timeline, and I'm not going to do that thing where people then read every single bit of information on the slide. 1600s, last recorded sightings of beaver in the UK hunted to extinction. In 2001, beavers were seen for the first time in 400 years, and these were assumed to have escaped from an enclosure further north. Um, now, at the time, the landowners where the beavers were discovered they want them there, and they um, requested that they were removed. Um, and it was, a, it was a really interesting situation. It led to the Scottish Beaver Group being established of a group of organisations that said, hang on a minute, we this is an amazing opportunity. We want to see what these beavers do. Let's not just put them back in a zoo. Let's not just take them away and panic. Actually, let's confront all these fears. Let's test, let's make some hypotheses. Let's test them. Let's see what the science tells us. Let's see what the beavers do. So they received a license. They were able to establish um, a captive population in Napdale. Um, in 2011, these animals were then 
said that they, they can remain there under license for five years and this can be a scientific study so that was fantastic we then started to see more animals being released into other sites around England um, and Scotland not in Wales and not in Northern Ireland so I can't really say UK but certainly in, in England and Scotland particularly England being released into captivity um, as large as possible for different reasons. Uh, the ones that were released in Devon, North Devon, was specifically to help with sediment catchment um, to see what they could do, see if to prove whether or not they could they could help with that sediment. Um, in 2013, wild beavers were spotted on the River Otter. And now this was the first time that wild beavers not in a captive population had been seen in England. And again, the response by the government was, right, capture them, move them, can't stay. This is really scary. Um, and again, fantastic uh, local response that said, no, actually, we really want these guys to stay. We're not that concerned. Let's wait and see what they do. So this then led to the River Otter Beaver Trial. And that's been um, an incredible trial that's really produced some fantastic data and science. So the animals were allowed to remain. And this was the first trial, and it is still the first trial, to monitor an uncontained population. There are no fences holding these animals in. The river otter population is deemed a success um, and in light of assorted studies of both wild populations and controlled releases natural england declared that beavers are allowed to remain in the uk as long as they're healthy and of eurasian descent the scottish government went another step further and they actually said well we're going to say that beavers are a native species again and offer them european protected species status um, 2017, beavers were introduced to fenced areas in Cornwall, specifically to enhance wildlife habitats, and again to help with cleaning water and to prevent with, uh, to control, sorry, to um, be a solution to frequent flooding issues. Um, and from there on in, there have just been more releases than it is um, easier to, to list. There's, there's, there's a lot of releases now. Um, Hatchmere Nature Reserve in 2020, part of a five-year plan to restore valuable wetland systems. Um, South Downs uh, released their in March 2020. Uh, the latest beaver release in March 21 um, in Corsdivy in Powys. Um, the Welsh government are still not really sure about this there's still actually quite a lot of opposition in wales a lot of concern about this there there was going to be a release with the southwest wales wildlife trust that had to be pulled at short notice and, and adapted um, because of local concerns and i think it's fair to say that the wildlife trusts have led on many if not most the the most of the beaver introductions across the, the country um, and our chief executive of the whole wildlife trust recently Craig Bennett was quoted as saying beavers are a fantastic keystone species that have a hugely important role to play in restoring nature to Britain um, the benefits for people are clear beavers help stop flooding downstream they filter out impurities they deliver grazing to prevent trees and shrubs invading wetland areas and they create new homes for other iconic wetland species including otters water voles, and kingfishers seeing them and their presence boosts tourists tourism in the countryside um, the beaver trust has highlighted the irony of how we spend large sums of money on flood relief schemes um, to slow streams and rivers and make them meander more where beavers will do it for free but crucially they will maintain it and they will maintain it for free and often the schemes um, big capital schemes all well and good but where's the money going to come from where's the infrastructure going to come from to um, maintain it long term so what next for beavers well so I'm very very excited to say little bit cautious it's taken us a long and tortuous journey to get to where to where we are today but i am really hopeful that by the end of september we will have beavers back in derbyshire for the first time in 400 years which is going to be a bit of an exciting moment um there's a defra consultation out at the moment now i think the link um is is going to get posted in the chat um 
if not for a consultation. Um, anybody can go and take part in this consultation. You don't need to have beavers. You don't need to be getting beavers. Um, you don't need to be um, representing your organisation that you work for. You can just be an interested member of the public and have your say, put your point across, answer the questions that are on there. So I would urge everybody to go and at least have a look at the consultation. Have a look at the information that DEFRA have provided. It's very comprehensive. They've got policies and procedures and ideas in place to manage our existing um, enclosed populations, um, future enclosed populations, um, future, sorry, existing wild living beavers, but also future wild living beavers. The day may come, which I hope very much, that a land lease beaver on their land with no fences is a step in very much in the right direction to get us to that point. It's also quite a pragmatic consultation to think about potential negative effects of beavers and to be fair there's been very few um, beaver introductions that have had any significant negative effects um, actually keeping a beaver in is possibly one of the hardest things to do and where beavers have escaped and there's been issues it's because they've just decided they wanted to go and live on a different bit of a water course a human's doing what we do best, meddling and interfering and trying to control a wild animal. So I would definitely urge people to please go and have a look at that. Um, tell other people about it. They also want to know what management and support that you think should be available to those who are managing beavers or have beavers on their land or may be impacted by having beavers on somebody else's land nearby. So they're looking at, you know, the options there as well. This consultation is only for beavers in England, and it's just running for 12 weeks and closes on the 17th of November. So you'll be pleased to hear, I'm going to shut up in a moment, briefly, come on presentation, go on sleep again. What next for Willington? So as I mentioned, Willington Wetlands, this uh, dark line shows the existing nature reserve. This land here, this is what I've got my eye on next. So this is Willington Semex, and actually all of this land over here and all of this land over here and all of this land here and here and here has now been finished working and is either in restoration or in fact is out of restoration. Um, we will hopefully be managing this land for Semex using the Longhorn cattle very soon. We have a project that I've received funding for to put a bridge in just here. This is a little yellow dot. So at the moment, this is a restricted byway that people can come down. They can walk along here. We have viewing platforms and we have a raised bird hide on a San Martin bank um, at about this point here. I'm going to put a new path in the and I'm going to put a bridge in here and I'm going to link to an existing bridle path that goes nowhere at the minute because it goes to the edge of the brook. This is going to come onto here and you're going to be able to access the Trent, you're going to come over the railway, access the Trent and Mersey Canal and there's going to be a loop that goes all the way back into Willington. So simply by installing a bridge here and putting another 250 metres of path in here, I'm going to be able to create a five mile loop within the wider landscape. So people can come and see the beavers from um, lots of different angles. They're going to be able to come on foot, on horse, on bike. We are working on a landscape scale with all the neighbouring landowners to be able to facil facilitate this access. We're hopefully making ecotourism a real thing, hopefully boosting the economy, the pubs, the restaurants, the shops, the b and bs the long visitor centre. When we started talking about having a visitor centre at Wellington, we joked and said, we'll have to build it on still yeah we'll have to build it on stilts it's a floodplain it floods we'll do that that's not a problem we're also looking at other species reintroductions so we know we have water vol on the site here and actually what's really great about the beaver project is the amount of monitoring and, and trail cameras and trapping and uh, longworth traps and you, you name it we've been out there surveying and monitoring every species imaginable on that site um 
we may it could be a site where we could use it as um, biodiversity net gain we could use it as a translocation site um, we are thinking about releasing pine martins in the derwent valley so lots and lots of options there as well um i think that's me done thank you very much Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Kate. That was really interesting. Um, if anyone's got any questions they want to ask, uh, if you just post them in the Q&A facility, then I can ask them to you, Kate, on your behalf. OK, we've got a couple coming in. Um, OK, so the first one's from Denise. Can you apply to any of the ELM schemes by using beavers? Uh, good question. I don't know is the honest answer. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that beavers are a mechanism that will be available um, under the uh, and supported by the ELM scheme. I think a lot of the information about the ELM scheme is still quite thin on the ground. It's very aspirational. It's very positive, the idea behind it all. I think um, a number of landowners are still rather scared, shall I say, uh, apprehensive about what provide what what the definition of providing public service, for land for public good, for public service, public money. I don't think that's still been made very clear what that really means. Um, but absolutely, I sincerely hope that Elms is a, is a support mechanism for people to consider Beaver as a management tool. Thank you for that. Um, another question, how do beavers and the decrease in speed in speed flow affect the potential nutrient loads in the area? Yeah, good question, actually. Um, again, um, I'll be entirely honest, I don't have any data, um, but it's an interesting one to look into. There's certainly been a lot of studies into silt and uh, silt deposition and suspended silt in water. Um, whether the same there's the same level of studies into nutrients i don't know i think in theory it would be fair to say that you would expect nutrients to be trapped the same in the silt the same way that we're sequestering carbon the same way that we are slowing water flows down we're creating if you imagine people use reed beds for example to clean dirty water or um um, septic tank overflows. Um, I think that's the principle that we're looking for with the beavers as well. So in theory, yes, you would hope to see reduced nutrient levels, but if you're trapping those silts, you're trapping that flow or that runoff from agricultural land. Um, definitely a study in there if anybody fancies doing a PhD. <laughs> The question, um, what impact do dams, sorry, what impact do the dams have on downstream fish populations? And then also sort of linked to that question I had is, are you expecting the beavers to attract any other species in? Yeah, fish is a really good question, actually. Um, quite funny, the number of people that say to us, oh, if we're not going to have any fish because the beaver will eat them all they won't they're genuinely vegetarian they will not eat the fish um we've been working with the wild trout trust um who um we've been doing we've done again done electro fishing we've done stream surveys um what we want to try and help show is that the evidence is that although they're creating dams these are not concrete barriers these aren't the sort of dams and sluices, sluices and weirs that human build these are leaky these are permeable we're not halting water flow we're simply slowing or oh, sorry they say that we the beavers i'm not a beaver um i feel like one sometimes but um simply slowing that water flow so the fish should be able to move through them there is mitigation that can be put in place to control water levels um, there's mitigation that can be put in into place to actually help facilitate fish passage through dams if needed. But I think that the moment is a case of, well, wait and see. Now, what was interesting at Willington was that we showed that the current, the Eggington Brook that flows through the reserve, the current fish population in there is disappointingly low and poor. The species diversity is low. The number of, of individuals is low. So actually we're starting from a really poor baseline there. So we're fairly confident we can't make it any worse. 
We're pretty confident we're going to make it better because the diversity and the pools that the beavers will create will actually create those areas where fish can have refuge from predators, where um, fry can grow and develop. Because sediment and nutrients are being trapped in the water, there's actually a, almost a richer water. There'll be a wider range of vegetation for the fish to, to again, that, that insect life, those 2000 species of invertebrates are going to be localized hotspots. So all the evidence suggests that they can only have a positive effect on fish. But that again is something that, that we're working with the Wild Trout Trust. We've got funding to repeat these surveys every year for the next five years to uh, evidence the change as well. Lovely, thank you. Um... Do you have any thoughts on the limited gene pool that we're sourcing, uh, that we are sourcing the beavers from in the UK? Yep, good question. Uh, this is a question. So Dr. Rasheen Campbell-Palmer is, um, you know, one of the UK experts on beavers. Um, she's currently working with the Beaver Trust. I would definitely recommend looking up her papers, um, looking up, the, her, she's published a phenomenal amount of literature and studies into beavers. Um, this is a question I asked her when she came and actually walked around Willington with me. I didn't appreciate, I've learned so much doing this. I didn't appreciate that beavers um, have a, a a family unit, male and the adult female will breed. So interbreeding is actually relatively limited. Um, I think interbreeding is also um, an issue or gene pool is an issue that we perhaps worry about too much. So let's look at a species like rabbits or rats that literally breed like rabbits nonstop with each other all the time. We don't see problems with inbreeding and hereditary complaints and issues and illness. Um, we see it in people. We don't necessarily see it so much in wild animals. It seems to be natural checks and balances. So it is a limited gene pool, um, but at the same time, it's a very healthy gene pool. And there is no reason to think that we are creating any kind of issues or problems here as well. Uh, what are the potential negative impacts of beaver reintroduction, if there are any? Um, and also, why are whales in particular go against beavers? Don't know. <laughs> not sure the Welsh government whether it's I don't know. I, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm not anti-farmer. Um, I work with a lot of farmers and Asian farm, whether it's more of a rural agricultural uh, economy in Wales and there's potentially um, conflict there or that that perception that there's going to be an issue. I genuinely don't really know but the Welsh government uh, perhaps it's just not a priority for them. There are much more, there are smaller devolved constitution you know government um it, 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 it they're not at this they're not at the same page where we are equally look at scotland they've taken a step the scottish government the U, the english government won't which is by declaring them a native species and actually they're welcome and they can stay and they don't have a problem with them so i suppose the difference is there a devolution um that's a totally different um discussion isn't it um and independence but I, I get you know they're making different decisions based on different data and it's different scenarios that they're responding to um sorry what was the first part of the question what distracted by whales <laughs> kind of negative impacts of sure, be yeah. the introduction um so uh it's a good question so when we're getting our beavers from Tayside the beavers that we are having are being relocated because they are perceived to be a problem they're not wanted where they are so these are coming from sites the landowners say actually we don't want the beavers they're causing an impact they're causing a problem um, the problem that they can be causing is that they are damming streams rivers and they are backing up bodies of water and they are creating floodplains now if that floodplain happens to be your best agricultural field and you're trying to grow maize or potatoes or it's your best grazing land that's really hard on you as an individual landowner and the um, income that you're trying to generate from that so that is a negative aspect that we have no control over where the beavers decide they're going to build their dams um, but there are methods to mitigate it so there are pipes that can be put through dams to actually trick the beavers into thinking that they've got a dam but the water level behind that dam can only ever get to a certain height to effectively put a sluice 
pipe in and moving to work quite well. Um, there are lots of other methods of mitigating having the effects of beavers on your land, but because in England they're not um, declared a native species and because of course that they are native species in Scotland, but like um, don't even get me started on badgers just because you're a native species and you've got protection doesn't mean you can't be shot uh, or cold if you're de deemed to be a problem um, then then that's what's happening but other than that actually again the data isn't suggesting that there are any significant negative impacts containing them is a real issue um, there's been 20 odd releases and we're in double figures of how many of those releases have had a beaver escape or breach a fence or a fence has got damaged. Um, they're a wild animal. We're trying to contain them. Um, there have been releases where it hasn't gone well and the beavers have had to be taken off the site because they can't be contained and they're, 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 they really are at a risk of serious injury or death to themselves or where they, they might go they might be crossing busy roads or um you know situations like that but no there don't seem to be any negative impacts of beavers but this is why we have to re release them under license this is why we have a five-year license um and at the end of it if the beavers if our project is deemed to not be a success or there's a negative impact those beavers will have to go we will have to remove them from willington the ambition is to be able to do as the wild population on the River Otter, and they'll be given license to remain. And actually the real ambition is to take the grills off the culverts, take down some of the fencing and let them go where they want to go. I don't know. I hope that's where we'll be in five years time, but we'll wait and see. Come back in five years time, I'll tell you then. You might have to have it there, talk in five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So following on from sort of following on from that previous question, um, what security do you have to have in place on the site, if any, um, due to previous conflicts with landowners um, in Scotland? I'd love to have 24 hour CCTV and I'd love to have um, our stations patrolling the fence line. Um, we have a duty of care to monitor the fence line anyway, at least, um, in fact, I'm, I'm not even sure it, how, how frequently, it's almost daily, uh, the terms of our license, we have to monitor that fence line to be, to, to be sure that it's not been breached. And I should say that I probably should have put some pictures of the fence in now it's finished. In most places around the site, the fence is six foot high. We then have an overhang angled in to the reserve. We have a skirt at the bottom of the fence that does that, it comes out um, 90 centimetres to a metre. And we also have a metre of trench fencing in the ground as well. So um, don't ask me how much per metre beaver fencing costs because it's, yeah, it's 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 a lot. <laughs> it's a complex thing. Um, we have we will be putting out a number of trail cameras on the site. We'll be walking the fence line, as I say. So we will have a large presence on the site anyway, um, and and monitoring what. Um, it's a forty six hectare site. How likely are you going to be to find the beavers or see the beavers to start off with? Particularly, it's going to be tricky. The fencing, I say, it's six foot high, it's um, 10 mil mesh. It's not going to be easily climbed or breached by people. Anyone that's foolish enough to try and cut the fence, um, the fence is in most places under eight tonne of strain. Um, that fence is going to ping back and it's going to seriously injure somebody, take their eye out, whatever. So hopefully anybody who tries to do that will be dissuaded from doing any more. Um, we will have lots of trail cameras out on site where we'll be monitoring the effects of the beaver anyway. And to be fair, this is how I honestly expect that we're going to see the most of our beavers is by having trail cameras out. So again, because of the security of checking those, we're checking those on a regular basis. We've got transects, we'll be walking. Um, I mean, to be fair, it sounds like these beavers aren't going to get a lot of peace and quiet actually, doesn't it? I'm probably, probably going to just be mithering the beavers every day. Um, lots of consultation locally. So far, we've had a very positive response from our neighbouring landowners. Um, I think it's fair to say that some of them are on the fence. Some of them are going to wait and see. They're not they're not declaring one side or the other yet, whether they like them or hate them. Um, but we have had a very positive response. So 
again, this is one of the reasons why we chose the site that we did. The feasibility study into the site wasn't just about, is it the right habitat? It was about a lot of things, including logistics, site security, visitor access, all of these things as well. So um, touch wood, we'll be okay. So uh, following on from that, I think you've perhaps already answered this in your previous answer, but are you worried about them escaping into the Trent or Mersey Canal and trying to dam the canal? Or <laughs> it sounds like the fence thing is going to keep them in. And, uh, I'm more worried about them escaping into the Trent, to be fair, because the Trent and Mersey Mersey Canal is at of um, the main East Coast railway line, which is in, which is on the embankment. So actually, the beavers are going to have to cross some land at the embankment, cross an incredibly busy railway line, which has a huge amount of heavy goods trains on it as well. Get down the other side, um, get through a quarry, and then get into the canal. I'm more concerned they're just going to bob off into the River Trent, which is a field away on the south side of the reserve um but you know if we if we lose a beaver we will know we've lost a beaver pretty soon we will be we were using drones to get a lot of aerial imagery and, and footage um we're only aiming to release two families and that actually could end up being just two adult pairs to start off with so it's not like we're having to monitor 20 30 beavers we'll have a small amount of individuals on the site to start off with um, pretty confident that we'll know if we've lost one um and then we we get it back so they shouldn't have time hopefully overnight to dam the canal but yeah that's that's an interesting one how long will it take for the beavers to actually start building their dam if, if they're being released quite soon will they have it ready in time for winter definitely um i I've actually found out the answer to that purely because I was quite curious. So um, under the terms of the license, because we're bringing this species in and we've got to try and make the habitat as, as nice for them as possible, we are encouraged to make a big pile of willow brush. So that's one of the jobs I need to do before they come is to go and cut down some willow trees and make a big pile of brush. So in the first instance, they don't even need to go and fell their own trees or saplings. The beavers that were released in Devon started making a dam within two days. So they started that they eat the willow. So they started chewing on vegetation um, for food, but also creating their own habitat within two days. So I am very confident that within a matter of days, weeks, we will and we will know then again through the, the monitoring that we'll be doing where the beavers have decided they want to settle. Now, there's nothing to say that they will stay settled at that point. They'll probably decide they want to move off or that might be their summer residence or their winter residence um but yeah they'll definitely should have time and but they think they've got to create these dams and lodges to be safe there aren't actually any beaver predators in there as well so it's quite nice okay um how do you contain the populations you've already sort of talked about the fences and bits um do you have to control the population numbers at all Again, no, we won't do any population control. Um, so what the, certainly the first pair that we've now got in captivity waiting to come down is an adult male, adult female. With luck, they will breed, they will have kits next year. They will be the breeding pair in that family unit. So the population growth isn't going to be exponential. It isn't going to be huge very quickly. Uh, it, it'll be fairly slow. So those three kits will stay with their parents. There may be another two or three kits the following year. Um, again, they will stay with their parents. They form family groups where the youngsters help raise the other youngsters. They wish for food, they help reinforce the dam, very much like badgers, where they work in these family units, but only will breed. Um, so no, we won't be controlling the population. We'll be very interested to see what the population will be. Bear in mind, this is only a five-year project. So in that sense, by the end of it, worst case scenario, we might have two beavers have become 14, 15 beavers. But in reality, you have to expect there might be some mortalities. Um, there might be youngsters that don't make it. We might have a, a very small litter one year and only have one kit. We just don't know. That's part of the whole project. Um, you mentioned that there aren't any predators, obviously, where these beavers are going. Uh, what species do predate beavers, if um, there are any? Nothing. <laughs> there are no natural predators for beavers at all. Um, they will 
again, like a lot of the larger keystone species or the larger mammals, particularly species, um, they have their own natural checks and balances and territories are often the way that they control. It's like, you know, why isn't the country an example? Why haven't we got badgers left, right and centre? Um, because they have territories, because there's only certain habitat where they can live. Um, so there's these natural checks and balances that nature itself is putting in um, to that. Okay. Um, are there any species, native species, that the beavers are likely to outcompete or force out of a habitat potentially? Sorry, any native species yeah so. are they get, will they outcompete any species or force species to leave the habitat due to the dam building uh there's absolutely no evidence so far that they have um and you might be thinking for example of species like water vole which um you know if their burrows are flooded then that they've lost their their home as it were um but actually because the beavers are hopefully going to even out the highs and lows of the water levels that we see in the uk these seasonal flows um for a species like water vole that a population can be wiped out very very quickly by a high flood event we could just drown um actually the beavers are going to help species like that that aren't terribly good at adapting to um, these uh, these urgent situations because the water level is going to be much more static and we're evening out some of those flows. So again, um, there's been no evidence so far whatsoever that there's any species that hasn't done well because beavers um, hasn't moved on. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, we've got to think very carefully about the larger mammals in the landscape as well. So otter and badger are the obvious ones at Willington. We've got to make sure that the fencing isn't preventing those from moving around the natural environment um, and, and again you know there's there's mitigation there's things that you put in the size of the grills on the culverts you can put little gates into the fencing for beavers on known uh, sorry badger routes um, but no we'll we'll monitor it but we don't anticipate anything okay lovely thank you um, there's no more open questions, but I've got a, a few others that I've jotted down. Um, you sort of briefly touched on capital projects and, uh, you know, these massive flooding schemes obviously cost hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of pounds. Is, are there any plans to work with like, any kind of water authorities or the EA perhaps in the future to actually use beavers in flooding projects? I don't know about a wider scale. I mean, Seven Trent Water have been phenomenal funders for us for this project. They are very at the front of understanding that we need natural solutions to man-made problems because man-made solutions haven't worked or aren't working or like you say, cost millions, hideous, hideous amounts, hundreds of thousands of pounds on, you know, one culvert or, or something like that. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Environment Agency, I think, are a little bit more wait and see. Um, again, you know, you can imagine this, they're, they're a government body, so they're more bound by um, the policies, the, the, the politics as well that are coming through from the current government. But doing this consultation, I think, is a really positive step. Um, this is the government doing this consultation. So for the bodies such as the Environment Agency that are ultimately governed by them, um, I think that's a really positive step that they are open to um, listening. They're open to discussion. Um, I'd like to think that, again, I guess the science is still quite new. Beaver reintroductions are still a very new thing. Um, I'd like to think in five years time that everybody will be doing it. And in fact, if you look at just the amount of reintroductions we've had in the last two years, even with COVID, um, it's suddenly rocketing. So fingers crossed. Really, that sounds really positive. Um, are there any other locations within Derbyshire or Nottinghamshire where you're planning on introducing beavers in the future? Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust are just behind us. Um, they're reintroducing them to Nottinghamshire in the on the Idle Valley. Um, sorry, just... someone was just expecting the doorbell to ring. Then, um... <laughs> uh, yeah, Nottinghamshire. Very sadly, actually, Nottinghamshire were right on our 
hot on our heels. We've got like a bit of a friendly rivalry going on about who'd get their first beavers, Nottinghamshire or Derbyshire. And then very sadly, they had a significant amount of their fencing material stolen. And no, it wasn't. It wasn't me. I didn't go and do it. I promise. They did ring me and ask, but no, it wasn't me. It wasn't us. Um, no, they had a they had a large amount of material stolen. And you can imagine at the moment, anyone who's doing any capital projects, you'll know that materials prices for everything has gone through the roof. Demand is ridiculously high. Um, beaver fencing is pretty much bespoke fencing as well um yeah so disappointingly they are about a month behind us now um but yeah we are doing feasibility studies on another four sites of our own land bear in mind we say we have 48 nature reserves in the county um and we are working with some other significant landowners in the county as well to say whether they'd like beavers the dream would be the consultation will finish really quick and go okay actually we just can let everyone have beavers and then we haven't got to spend hideous amounts of money on beaver fencing but i think that's a dream isn't it but but yes definitely watch this space brilliant um and then lastly then uh, you already sort of touched on this as well and um, about other reintroductions at the wildlife trust planning and you've already said about pine martin yep. are there any more that might be coming to the, to the region uh, probably uh I, I i've been away for two days on a conference and come back and we've managed to purchase land and we've got things just seem to be happening at a, such a speed at the moment within derbyshire wildlife trust um pine martins are the one at the moment but there's lots of other species that we are looking at and we're certainly carrying out feasibility studies we're working really closely with rewilding britain they've been a really supportive partner and um, people to work with um, to look at feasibility studies for a, a range of species so reintroductions as well as um i suppose translocations of species as well i know not spotlight trust but very recently had an adder reintroduction um seminar and a conference um, we have adder in derbyshire nottinghamshire they have no adder whatsoever so they are actually looking into methods of um reintroducing them to the county that's really interesting i just assumed that adders were everywhere oh so, yeah again it's yeah you find these bits of information out and think oh didn't realize there's been no adders in in nottinghamshire cited 300 years wow you'd think they'd just crawl over the border wouldn't you but no <laughs> um, just had a question coming from Chris. Um, regarding flood risk reduction, there is evidence that they help with low order floods and in smaller catchments. There is little evidence for high order events or large catchments, so as ever more evidence is needed. And the more beavers there are, the more evidence confidence they can be gained. So, sorry, there's not, not a question in there, but um, Absolutely. yeah, some really interesting. Yeah, very, very succinct, pertinent observation and perhaps that's because we haven't released them in large scale a lot of the releases have been very small i was again surprised how small areas you had two three hectares when we first looked at willington we had six hectares of the site that we were going to fence out and i was again really surprised like gosh you know how many beavers can six hectares take you know what half a beaver this is crazy no that's that's what one family would be quite happy with forever. So 46 hectares have, goodness, about five or six families. Um, but I think it just hasn't been done on a bigger scale yet. So um, let's hope that we can all be bigger and bolder and braver and, and try it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds really interesting, and really exciting. And uh, I think it'd be definitely worth having a catch up in the future to see how the the beaver families have all got on. Um, Absolutely, at yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm delivering so many talks about the beavers are coming. I'm really excited to be able to say that. Give me into October, I think I'll be able to start saying the beavers are here. Um, and you know, we say we, you know, we're hoping to see the impact of them really soon. Um, but you know, do come down to Willington and try and see a beaver. I'm not going to promise you're going to see one. Um, we are we'll have a lot of media around the release event, as you can imagine. So do keep an eye on um, the press. And this is national press and um, in fact, even international press are showing interest in coming to the, the beaver release event. Um, 
definitely site. Um, I think that perhaps got posted in the chat, sorry, in, in a, earlier on, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust website, and also um, we've got a page dedicated for Willington, so if you want to know more about the reserve, where it is, our other nature reserves, um, yeah, drop me an email and I'll show you around. <laughs> Brilliant, we'll hold you to that. Sure, I don't mind. <laughs> Well, there's no other questions now, um, and this is like a good good time to wrap up. So thank you everyone to attend for attending. I um, hope you enjoyed it, and thank you very much to Kate to presenting. Um, I'll hand back over to Barbara for some closing comments, but otherwise, thank you very much, everyone.